Arnold Schoenberg's second string quartet, written in 1908, is quite a bit shorter than his first, coming in at just over half an hour in this recording, and it is a far more voluptuously beautiful work than the first. I know that any presentation of Schoenberg's music is likely to send many music lovers running for their lives, and I don't want to make it even less likely that people will listen to this masterpiece by larding it up with a half hour's worth of commentary, even though it's one of those works that could easily occupy a full semester's worth of discussion in a graduate level seminar. It is a watershed work in many respects and begs for the kind of close scrutiny that would quickly turn this video into something completely unwatchable. I'll therefore try to say a few useful things about it and will leave most of the discoveries to you. I'll furnish links to a couple of commentaries that may be useful to you if you wish to explore this music further. Like his first quartet, Schoenberg's second is laid out in four movements appearing in the same order. Unlike the first, these movements are demarked by full stops and the silences that follow. So I'll be talking about each of the movements in turn. In the first two movements, I'll talk about the overall architectural plan as usual. In movements three and four, however, my comments will be aimed in a different direction. That's because Schoenberg's second quartet includes settings of two poems by Stefan Georga, sung by a soprano, during those movements. Not only was this unprecedented in the history of the string quartet genre, it has very few progeny. It certainly presents us with something that has been true at various times in the history of Western music. That is, whenever a completely novel approach to composition is being explored, the human voice is summoned to shoulder part of the burden of new expression. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony is another good example of this principle at work. Schoenberg's second quartet is in F-sharp minor, and its primary key centers make sense in a fairly traditional way. Movement one is set in the work's tonic key. The scherzo that follows is in the submediate key, D minor. The slow movement is in E flat minor, which is the relative key of the main key's enharmonically respelled parallel major. And movement four ends in F sharp major, its lack of a key signature notwithstanding. It is on account of that last feature that many commentators date the onset of the composer's venture into free atonality, his first steps into the aesthetic territory known as abstract expressionism, to this string quartet. It is, of course, no secret that many equate Schoenberg's abandonment of traditional Western tonality with his taking leave of his senses, but it must be obvious how driven he was to it, considering he spent a full decade of his creative life in those virgin fields prior to the working out of his 12-tone system in the early 20s, a system that many argued made of music a kind of mathematics. Those commentators I mentioned earlier also make much of the fourth movement's first line of sung text, I feel the air of other planets. There are other references, both poetic and musical, to leave-taking in this quartet, including a quotation in movement two of Ach du lieber Augustin, a sad little song that ends with the line, Alles ist hin, all is lost. If you read some of the biographical literature regarding the composer's personal circumstances in 1908, you will realize how deeply autobiographical the quoting of that little song was, in addition to its prophetic import in this context. In this video, we'll hear the Ardity Quartet with soprano Dawn Upshaw. Movement one, set in the quartet's tonic key, uses that key as a point of departure quite a few times during its unfolding, although the music, having a will of its own, invariably leaves that reference behind to explore the complete chromatic gamut in a free and flourishing way. Its overall shape is governed mostly by the principles of sonata form, although those strictures are mainly honored in the breach. Both of its important themes are launched in F-sharp minor, tinged with melancholy. The second member of the first theme group exhibits the manners of a Viennese waltz, but filled with regret. This is music at the end of empire, 
and it has much in common with the language of Gustav Mahler, the most towering musical figure of the 20th century's first decade. This opening movement is quite short, just a little under six and a half minutes in this recording, but it furnishes the tonal palette for the entire work, its constituent motives coming in for exhaustive treatment again and again in the ensuing three movements. The ending is dark, made even more so by the cello's Phrygian approach to the final F-sharp minor cadence. Thank you. 
The cello opens movement two with a kind of drumming on a low D. This distinctive feature will return several times to demark the movement's sections and to bring it to a close. We have here a scherzo of sorts, somewhat unconventional in its design. Its basic organization is that of a rondo, but there is also a sense in which the movement is set up in three large parts that correspond roughly to scherzo, trio, and scherzo da capo. It's during the second large part of the movement that Schoenberg paraphrases a sad little song from the 16th century, Ach du lieber Augustin. This is undoubtedly an autobiographical touch, and I will leave it to you to discover just how abysmal Schoenberg's personal circumstances were at the time of its writing.
It is perhaps in movement three that the doors to the musical future are flung wide, and it is the impassioned, angst-filled poetry of Stefan Gjorga, whose collection Der Siebente Ring, published just a year earlier, that provided Schoenberg with the words needed to open those doors. The movement is constructed in variation form, its thematic substance derived from the motives set forth in Movement 1, followed by five variations and a coda. I will ignore all that, however, and will instead focus on Georg's haunted lines. His couplets, together with Schoenberg's musical commentary thereon, speak for themselves. I want only to mention the climax of the movement, a death-defying plunge of over two vocal octaves on Liebe in the final line, Nimm mir die Liebe, gibt mir dein Glück. Take from me my love, give me your joy. The E-flat minor coda is simply choked silent at the height of its final protest.
in this score, the fourth movement's title, Entschuldigung, is rendered rapture, although the word's range of meaning also includes escape and leaving behind. In a sense, it is those shades of meaning that the composer captured in his dropping of a key signature for the movement, and seems to be an acknowledgement that the music has grown beyond the bounds of tonality. To quote from the poem, the former paths once so loved are now unrecognizable. The singer's first words, Ich fühle Luft von anderen Planeten, I feel the air of other planets, could not possibly say it better. This movement has a sonata-like shape, but I will ignore that, as in movement three, again focusing on Georga's beautiful three-line stanzas. As earlier, I will mostly let those verses and the accompanying musical commentary speak for themselves, but I do want to say that Schoenberg's setting of Georga's last two lines, I am only a spark from the holy fire, I am only a whisper of the holy voice, is one of the most transcendent and deeply moving moments in all of music for me. And the sweet, finely wrought epilogue that follows it, melting at last into the glow of F-sharp major, the time-honored modal corrective to the whole, making of the entire work a large-scale Picardy cadence, reliably leaves me overwhelmed and speechless with its beauty. I hope you experience something like that as you listen.
Thank <laughs> you. 